Good morning. Welcome to Truth for Today. This is Dai Qing Yuan, your host and teacher, pastor of Ambulin Bible Church. Today we're continuing our study of the book of Daniel. And uh, this is uh, our mini series number 21. And uh, this is the first section. The title for today is The Persecution by the Major Antagonist, Part 1 the actions of the Antichrist. The texts uh, are in Daniel 11, 36 through 45. Overall, we have learned that the kingdom of God has four phases. From creation to Abraham, it was the fuzzy kingdom. And uh, it lasted about 2,000 years. And then from Abraham to Christ, it was the visible kingdom when everything is related to the visible people, nation, land, city, temple, priest, king, and law of Israel. However, for they are not all Israel who are descendant, descended from Israel. In other words, not all Israelites are true Israelites. And uh, there, need, there is a need of a spiritual reformation from within. So this was the uh, Israelite period. Before that, it was pre-Israelite period. This is also 2,000 years. And from Christ's first coming to his second coming is the spiritual kingdom, in which the kingdom of God is spiritual, it's unshakable, uh, it's called the kingdom of heaven, it's the church age, it's the age of grace, and it's always already spiritual but not yet full kingdom. This lasted to almost 2,000 years now. This is the church period. And then from the second coming of Christ to the last judgment is the full kingdom. It's also called the millennium, literally 1,000 years. At that time, the kingdom is both visible and spiritual, thus full. So overall, the uh, time from the creation to the last judgment is about 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 1,000, about 7,000 years. For in six days, God created heaven and earth, and then the last day, God rested. And 1,000 years is like a day for God. So this is the overall um, historiography of the Bible. And now, Israel has a pattern in Old Testament. It has a rise and it has a fall. Its rise is characterized by 430 years of um, age of promise from a uh, Abraham coming out of Ur to the time of Exodus and then 390 years for the internal rise of Israel the formation of the character from the beginning of its slavery about 1533 BC to the end of the illegal kingdom of Abimelech and uh, they were freed from a certain uh, slavery uh, well, they began a, their slavery, actually, uh, to Egyptians, and then later they became slavery, uh, slaves of their sins. Okay, And then there's another 390 years for the rise of Israel, and uh, that is from the conquest to uh, the time of David, the great king. And that's another 300 years, 1400 to 1100. Uh, to, uh, uh, 1010 yeah and um, uh, but from the time of Gideon uh, he committed two sins religious sin of making the golden ephod and the social sin of uh, not um, well accepting the the relaxed definition of the um, sabbatical and jubilee years counting the jubilee as the second half of the 49th year not the 50th year and uh, and from then on the religious sin of israel was counted for how long 390 years and with a gap during the time of uh, the reign of david and solomon and uh, the the social sin of judah was also counted it's counted for 490 years also with a gap uh, under the reign of david and solomon uh, they reigned over the north different different times. Okay, um, the um, David ruled over the north for only thirty three years, not forty, but he ruled over the south for forty. So that's why we have seventy three and eighty years different gap. But 
at the end, one ended at 723 BC. That's exactly the time of Israel's captivity to Assyria. And the other ended at 605 BC, which is exa exactly the first captivity of, of Judah to Babylon. And then uh, Israel was simply lost, but Judah uh, had a uh, return. But they had three captivities in 605, 597, 586, and three returns, 534, uh, 458, and 444. Okay? And the temple was built, uh, uh, was uh, uh, destroyed on 586 and rebuilt in 515 for 70 years. So they were without temple for 70 years. And then their return from the first captivity to the first return was also 70 years. So that's the lowest of, of Israel. Okay, a rise and a fall. And then um, if you count the exact days, this is the fall, counting from uh, Gideon, uh, 1186 BC, minus 390 years, minus 73 years gap, you get 723. For Judah, you get 1186 BC minus 490, which is 70 missing sabbatical years, minus 80 years, that's the gap under David and Solomon, and minus 11, which are the jubilees in the, the sum of 490 and 80. That's 570 years, 50 years each, you get 11. And then you get 605. So that's how the Israel fell. Okay, But the fall will be um, matched by the rise. The fall of Judah took 490 years with a gap. The, uh, the, uh, the rise will also be 490 years with a gap. The gap under David and Solomon are spiritualized as, uh, in their names. David is the beloved. He is called the Son of God in Psalm 2. Solomon is the son of David, and he is the Prince of Peace, as Shlomo, the name. Okay. These are the visible kingdom of God exhibited at its highest. And then in the Restoration, 490 years is... Uh, the 77s of Daniel, and it has a gap. After 69 sevens, the gap is the church age, when Jesus Christ was the king of Israel, but not accepted by them, but accepted by Gentiles. And Jesus Christ is all of the above as David and Solomon. He is the beloved son of God, son of David, prince of peace. Uh, the church age is the spiritual kingdom of God exhibited, and there's still one seven. Uh, left, that's called the tribulation. And after that, it was the second coming of Christ and the restoration of the glory of Israel. So that's a united pattern of history and prophecy. So the book of Daniel is about the kingdom of God. It's written at the lowest time of Israel. It's Israel as the visible kingdom of God has fallen. There's a time of Gentile rule, but there will be a restoration. Okay, And uh, uh, the part Two and part three are all written with symmetric uh, st structures. And uh, we are now in 11, the last part of 11, uh, which is actually moved to this part. Because um, chapter 11, 1 through 35 are historical, talking about the minor antagonist um, and uh, the way to the minor antagonist. And then from 1136 and on, it is talking about the last days because the king mentioned there does not match any of the historical people, but it seems to match the uh, end time uh, behavior of the, the, the great Antichrist um, and uh, as prophesied elsewhere, so it matches. Therefore, we believe this is the last days predicted, the persecutions by the major antagonist, which is symmetric to here, persecution by the minor antagonist in chapter 8. Okay, so here we are. The four empires, uh, there are four um, Gentile empires um, predicted by Daniel from his time. Okay. Before him there was Egypt and there was Assyria. They were worldwide empires who oppressed Israel, and there are four more later. And they are Neo-Babylonia, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And the Roman Empire will be broken by the church age. 
but then it will be restored at the tribulation time. Um, Christ came here in the Rome, Roman Empire. And um, in the New Babylonian Empire, Israel was disciplined. During the Middle Persia, Israel will be restored. And in during the Greek Empire, Israel will be persecuted by the little Antichrist, which is the historical Antiochus IV. Okay. And then um, it, during the Rome, Roman Empire, there will be a confrontation. God sent his son, the Messiah. And then he was uh, cut off because his people, the Jews, rejected him. And then they used the Romans to kill him. But in this process, Jesus Christ actually redeemed his bride, the elect of mankind before the foundation of the world. And therefore, that's the church age. Okay, During the, this time, this is the gap. Okay? And uh, uh, the, the temple will fall and uh, the, the land will be desolate. And then the, 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 the temple will be rebuilt during the tribulation. And there's another little horn, which is the major antagonist or the great antichrist. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the path to the major antagonist, uh, antichrist will already was already predicted in Daniel 9, but the path to the minor uh, Antichrist was done in Daniel 11. Okay, so um, that is the, yeah, the time, the exile, which was accepting Daniel part one. The little Antichrist was illustrated in Daniel part two, part three, and the great Antichrist was introduced in Daniel part two. Okay. All right. So finally, uh, let's review the structure of Daniel 10 through 12. There was a spiritual warfare behind the historical event in Daniel 10. Uh, and that uh, Jesus Christ actually came into the world to um, as the, the angel of the Lord. He uh, contacted, reviewed the end time scheme to Daniel, okay, a well-respected person, even in heaven. Okay. Then there was a brief history before the Hellenistic Kingdom, a truncated history of Middle Persia, a brief history of Macedonian Greece. These are all in the beginning of chapter 11. Then there's a detailed history of two Hellenistic kingdoms, uh, the King of South and the King of the North. Then there was the action of the minor antagonists. These are in the ma majority of chapter 11. And the ending part of chapter 11 is actually the actions of the major antagonist, the great Antichrist, at the end time. And then chapter 12 is the last days prophesied and sealed. So all of these happen during one historical event and the speech. Uh, however, they can be divided into these sections. Okay. Now, verse 36 of chapter 11 of Daniel. He reads, Then the king will do as he pleases, and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods and he will prosper until the indignation is finished for that which is decreed will be done okay. the king is not specified as either Antiochus the fourth as one of the kings of the north okay uh, and or as Alexander the Great as a mighty warrior king. He does not need to be specified, for the author assumed that the reader will know whom he is by the context. Daniel 8 to 12 is using the minor antagonist, that is Anti Antiochus IV, to illustrate the major antagonist, that is the end time uh, an antichrist. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, he will do as he pleases. That means the king will be known by his extreme arrogance, authoritarianism, and petulant temper. Okay, um, he is like a, a giant infant. I will do what I do. I will I, what I want to. Uh, and then he will exalt and magnify himself above every god. So he will accept polytheistic gods in the concept, but exalt himself above all of them. Okay? So he's making himself the god. 
Okay. Um, he he actually believed there's multiple gods, which are the the angels, but he put himself above all of them. So just this is just like what the um, what uh, Lucifer did in the beginning. He said, "I will be the Most High." The Most High doesn't mean he's replacing the Creator, the God of all creations, but it simply means he's higher than all creation, angels or humans. Okay, and he speaks monstrous things against the God of gods. Okay, that means the true God. He also accepts the monotheistic God in concept. Um, but he will speak monstrous, that in Hebrew, pala, that means surpassing or extraordinary things against the true God. In King James, marvelous. In uh, English Standard uh, Version, astonishing. NIV, unheard of. Okay. Um, in the Net Bible, New English Translation, presumptuous. In New King James Version, blasphemous. And the uh, New Revised Standard Version, horrendous. In um, uh, Tanakh, which is the Jewish uh, JPS translation, Jewish translation, Jewish press uh, society, um, and it says awful, or Young's Living Translation, wonderful. That means things of wonder, that means um, imagination. Okay. So the same was said in 824 by Antiochus IV. So in other words, the greater Antichrist will behave just like the little Antichrist in history and more. It seems that he will identify himself as God and m might do miracles in the name of God. So you can believe, uh, you can see that this person has dualistic worldviews. He will believe in polytheistic, world, polytheistic uh, worldview, but he also believes in a monotheistic worldview. So he is therefore both a, um, a pagan and a, a Jew <laughs> in bloodline, in pagan in worldview, maybe New Age, pantheism in worldview, and he is a Jewish, thus monotheistic in tradition. So he will have a little bit of both. Okay. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished. Okay. The indignation in Hebrew ta'am, which means indignant anger, is the wrath of God. In 819, it was the wrath of God against Antiochus IV. In the context of the tribulation at the uh, end time, the wrath of God could be against the sins of his people Israel or of the whole humanity. Anyway, the wrath of God or the indignation of God is throughout the whole seven-year tribulation, not just second half. That is called the greater tribulation. Okay, And the great tribulation, the first half is, uh, and the whole thing is called the tribulation. Okay, and that which is de decreed will be done. Okay, uh, the word for decree here is in Hebrew, uh, karatz, that is cut, sharpen, decide, which was used in 927. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. You see, um, um, one that's decreed, that is, decided, um, predicted, uh, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Uh, who makes it desolate? Okay, I think it's the, the Antichrist is uh, uh, making the land desolate by doing things that's extraordinarily blasphemous. Then God, in his anger, will make the land desolate. And uh, who is decreed? Well, the one who decreed is Jesus Christ in his second coming. He will come out and pour out God's anger over the one who makes desolate, the Antichrist. The second coming Christ will destroy the, um, the, Christ, uh, the Antichrist. So that which is decreed, second coming of Christ, will be done. So now we see uh, this, the king is talking about the end time antichrist. He's not talking about any historical person. 
Okay, verse 37 gives us a portrait of the king. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. Okay, the gods of his fathers, Elohi uh, of Taiv, the word Elohim means God, plural of majesty, or gods, literal plurality. So either the gods of his fathers or the God of his fathers. Okay. Um, well, if he is um, a Jewish man, the, his father's God would be Yahweh. Okay. If uh, this is talking about his pagan a country that he lives in, uh, and then that will be the pluralistic gods. So God of his fathers in King J KJV and New King James, and Yang's little translation made tr translation that way. The king is Jewish. Okay, the gods of his fathers, as in RSV, NRS, NAS, and uh, SU, um, and uh, maybe NAU probably. Um, New American update. Uh, and ASV, ESV, okay, and NIV, these are different strands of good translations. Uh, the king is pagan. So, um, how do you translate it? It really depends on how do you understand this king will be, okay? And he actually is both. Okay, he's both pagan and Jewish. So throughout the Bible, the God of fathers refers to Yahweh, the Lord, the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay, in this many places. So it would be more, um, I guess, in the tradition of the Bible, in consistency, if we translate it as the God uh, of his fathers, okay. That, in other words, emphasize his Jewish background, okay. And uh, this translation is a little out of place. Okay, now he neither did he care about the desire of women. Okay, if it means the general desire of women, which is love and family, then the king would not have any love for women. This perhaps means that he's a homosexual. Okay, as it happens very often in the uh, Luciferian satanic. Uh, uh, believes that they want the inversion. They want to invert good with evil, right with wrong, male with female, and uh, um, well, um, all of the gender things, you know, as above, so below. So uh, that would not be surprising. Okay, this is perhaps, uh, and the whole sentence of he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women means that he's neither religiously pious or orthodox in Judaism, nor socially just, or normal, or good. Okay. However, if it means the special desire of Jewish women, which is becoming the mother of the Messiah, then the king would not care for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay. This means that he cares neither for the God of the Old Testament, the Biblical Judaism, nor the New Testament, that is, Christianity. Okay. So both translations would have its merit. Okay. Nor care about any other god that is unbiblical divinity, okay, such as polytheistic gods or the Islamic Allah, um, which was a moon god elevated to be the sole god. Okay, so he, um, I think it's probably a little bit of both. Okay, uh, in my understanding, he, uh, you know, he will be from um, a Jewish bloodline. But he will be from Islamic country, and specifically Turkey, because that's the Ottoman Empire. Then um, he will also lead the revived Roman Empire, which is the new European Union with only 10 countries. And three of them have been Islamicized, so controlled by him. I would say those will be Germany, France, and England, perhaps. And uh, um, so he neither care about the pagans, nor care about the Christians, nor care about the Jews. But he will exalt himself above them all. Okay. And uh, in 38, but instead he will honor 
a god of fortress, a god whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures. So a god of fortress in Hebrew, uh, ma'utz, is a palace or means of safety and protection. If interpreted metaphorically, honoring such a god means materialism and militarism. Uh, gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures will mean general wealth. Big military budget? <laughs> well, um, taking the, the public money as selves. <laughs> okay, if interpreted literally, the, there are gods worshipped by people who used to live in mountainous fortresses, like the Moabites or the Edomite gods, Moloch or Baphomet. Then gold, silver, costly stones, and treasures will be literal gifts to the idols, too. I wouldn't be surprised if he worships Baphomet or Moloch. That's um, what, what today's Luciferians would do. Anyway, we got a, a general picture of the end-time Antichrist. We will dig deeper next time we meet. May God bless his word so accurate. Amen. We are living in a chaotic time when the world is in darkness and desperately needs God's truth and love. We believe that this is the time for Christians to believe and to pray and then to act as God's agent to unite all people to trust in God and to live righteously, caringly, and lovingly so that we can all get through the difficult time and then put this country back into order and prosperity. And uh, this is the time not for uh, doubt. This is the time for um, believing that God intends to bless his children those, especially those who love him and, uh, and serve him. And while the blessing may not necessarily be material or financial, but going through difficulties and training our character is definitely a part of the, uh, the blessing. And then I pray that the people who listen to our programs at this time will recognize that we are living in a designed time, interesting time, and it's a good time so that we may learn about God and to serve others on behalf of God. So I pray that all of us who have learned and who have believed, now let us put our time into prayer and into love to our immediate surrounding, the family, and then if you have um, contacts other than family, do the same. Be gracious, be loving, and then be Christ-like, for His truth and His name is what will last forever. May God bless you, in Jesus' name, amen.